All right, so this is my presentation on Elliot Earls and the Apollo program. And first, we're going to talk about the Apollo program because um, that kind of came first, um, just historically. So a little bit of background. Um, the space race was a competition in the late 50s and even into the 70s between Russia, which at the time was called SSR or USSR and between the United States during the Cold War to basically just discover the unexplored areas of space and to create this like rivalry um, and show authority um, against each other. So the Soviet Union achieved the first successful space launch on October 4th, 1957 of Sputnik, Sputnik 1. And then they also proceeded to send the very first human, who was Yuri Gargarin, into space on April 12th, 1961. Um, and then as a response to this, on May, um, in May of 1961, uh, President John F. Kennedy at the time addressed the nation and made a statement that the goal was to land astronauts on the moon by the end of the decade and then send them home safely. Um, so we're going to talk about their goals. Um, the Project Apollo's goals weren't just to send man into space and land on the moon and return them safely. Um, they're basically listed as um, establishing technology to meet like national interest in space. So they wanted to increase uh, knowledge of technology and just keep um, growing in that aspect. They wanted to achieve prominence in space for the United States, so basically asserting dominance nationally. Um, they wanted to carry out a program of scientific exploration of the moon, so not just to send man, but to like land on the moon and do um, you know, scientific experiments and gather data and all that kind of stuff. And they also wanted to develop human capability to work in the environment of space um, and on the moon. So they did a lot of training and conditioning. Some interesting facts about this time. Um, the program resulted in a total of 11 space flights and it achieved the goal of walking on the moon as we know. The first four flights just tested equipment that was used for the program. The six of the other seven flights did successfully land on the moon. The first Apollo flight happened in 1968, and then the first actual moon landing took place in 1969. So that time frame is quite incredible. It basically took us a little over seven years to have the technology and the resources to land a man on the moon. Um, and then the last moon landing was in 1972. So a total of 12 astronauts walked on the moon. The astronauts conducted scientific research there. They studied the moon's surface. They collected rocks to bring back to Earth. And however, there were many tests that were very successful. Others were not, which caused a lot of setback. Um, there was a bunch of fires um, they, that killed the crews that worked on the ships. There were failed launch tests, a lot of electrical problems, and then, as you all probably know, the ending, um, the last, like, bad thing that happened was Apollo 13 malfunction when they were coming back into Earth's orbit and something exploded and they basically had to have an emergency landing. So here's kind of a timeline that I made of the events that happened in um, where and when we sent ships out into space. Um, so basically, Apollo 7 and Apollo 8 both happened in 1968. Um, they were both uh, successful. Um, they really only like tested the technology and the command modules, and Apollo 8 was when we orbited the moon but not landed on it. And then Apollo 9 through 12 all happened in 1969, which is insane and really cool that we can have you know those four major test flights and successful flights happen in one year um so apollo 11 as you know was the first moon landing um and that was with neil armstrong buzz aldrin and then collins um apollo 13 was supposed to land on the moon but there was a malfunction um, and then 14 and 15 again happened in 1971. 
and Apollo 16 and 17 happened in 1972, and Apollo 17 was the last um, space shuttle that was sent and landed on the moon. So the importance of this program is basically that NASA did, in fact, meet their goal of putting a man on the moon, as well as navigating around other obstacles in their way. They achieved a lot of firsts for America, as well as a lot of firsts for mankind in general. These missions made further exploration and achievements possible in space and of other planets and stuff like that. So now we're going to talk about Elliot Earls. And he, um, Elliot Peter Earls, was born in 1966 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He went to school at an all-boys school where his focus originally was on athletics. And then he went on to attend Rochester Institute of Art. Or Rochester Institute of Technology. Sorry. My bad. Um, in 1998. Um, and then after that, he attended Cranbrook Academy of Art as a grad student where he pursued art. And then he graduated from there in 1993. So just about him and about his works. Um, he is a graphic designer who often works in creating typefaces. He is a just um, studio artist, um, and he also is a performing artist, and he performs as a one-man band, which I think is really interesting um, in some of, the, some of the work that he does, and I thought that was really unique how wide of a range of stuff that he has. He's worked for many names, um, like, uh, I, I believe it's pronounced non Such records or something like that little brown uh scrivener and he has worked for cartoon network um but has he's been fired from a lot of his jobs and been in and out of work because of his odd mannerism and style um and he's often considered kind of incompetent and not able to work well with others which i thought was interesting considering how popular he was um, he's been an artist in resident in, uh, and the head of grad, graduate graphic design, uh, the head of the graduate graphic design program, excuse me, at Cranbrook Academy of Art since 2001, um, and he's still there. Um, and his work can be seen in tons of exhibitions, um, such as the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt uh, National Design Museum, Wolfsonian Museum, Miami Art Museum, um, a bunch of other places in Milan. Uh, he was also awarded with an Emerging Artist Grant from Manhattan's prestigious Wooster Group for his performing arts, um, which I thought was also unique, um, which he's really well known for being a performing artist, but also his typefaces. Um, he's performed internationally at parades and a bunch of different music halls. So here we can see, I'll kind of explain the visual. Um, in 1995, created this CD or kit of his designed work called the Apollo Program, which was named after the NASA program, obviously, like I just talked about. Um, this was a reference, the name, to the mentality and optimism and exploration at the time of his work. So he wanted to kind of reference, like, the wonder and all of what happened with the Apollo Program. Uh, he has been considered kind of a grunge graphic designer for his style of, quote, distorted, older typefaces um, that are almost often, um, that are often almost like really illegible, as you can see. Um, these works are very unique and have kind of this essence of a grunge aesthetic, which in spite of being in a very different form from each other, have kind of the same amount of um, intentionality behind them so they were very like well thought out typefaces he didn't just kind of throw them together um, he clearly was influenced by the Dada movement um, and I think he has this quote of trying to explain how he um, you know comes up with these styles and what they mean um, and I'm going to read it verbatim because I think it is very unique to his person um, he explains these typefaces um, and says Think of these fonts as my vision in, induced by a string found on my table or my uh, pieta or my revolution by night, the grotesque caricature of the world of the post-World War I avant-garde and the 
and and we I think is how you pronounce it of the Venetian posters uh, poser skate punk are the tools at my disposal like the half wit Carol April who flung cannon bolish like a circus clown at his canvas I too paint like a barbarian and a barbaric age I am thoroughly disinterested in the eloquence and simulated pro profoundity that lies between quotation marks but for the sake of ritualized discourse let me take a stab at it by quoting max ernst a painter is lost if he finds himself the fact that he has succeeded in not finding himself and he's referring to max ernst is regarded by ernst as his only achievement well played i too cherish the suppression of logic midnight games of chinese checkers but to what end this question sweeps across my cerebellum like some medieval bubonic plague, leaving in its foul wake the stench of relativis the re- the stench of relativism and post utopian thought. I am the sad child of the lost tribe of Ebola monkeys, intellectually, environmentally, and financially disenfranchised. And let me just say, if God doesn't speak to what kind of character he had, I really don't know what does. Because to me, that entire paragraph is just hilarious and like screams kind of the like chaos of his character and his work um so basically this is his blue eyeshadow typeface made in 1993 uh this is the venus dioxide and typhoid mary made in 1994 and there are two variations of each and this is his jigsaw uh drop shadow made in 1998 and these are his most i would say well-known works Um, And other than that, these are my sources. Thanks, guys.